I really never thought this moment would come when I would actually get to part 3 of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. But lo and behold, here it is. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's medical review series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. We continue with the last part of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend we have covered hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and we are concluding in this video. In the past two videos, which I presume you should have watched by now, we discussed gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, as well as eclampsia. In this very short video, we will look at chronic hypertension with or without superimposed preeclampsia. Here's a warm-up question. You are doing postpartum rounds on a 22-year-old G1 para 1 who vaginally delivered an infant male at 36 weeks after an induction for severe preeclampsia. During her labor, she required hydralazine to control her blood pressures. She is on magnesium sulfate for seizure prophylaxis. Her vital signs are blood pressure 154 over 98, pulse 93, respiratory rate 24, and temperature of 37.3 degrees Celsius. She has adequate urine output of at greater than 40 milliliters per hour. On examination, she is oriented to time place, but she is somewhat and oh somnolent rather and her speech is slurred she has good movement and strength in her extremities but her deep tendon reflexes are absent which of the following is the most likely cause of her symptoms a adverse reaction to hydralazine b hypertensive stroke c magnesium toxicity d sinus venous thrombosis e transient ischemic attack so keep in mind this question write down your answer scream it at the screen i will give you the answer at the end of the lecture so keep the slide in mind, I think we've talked about this in the past two videos, so I don't really need to go over this and emphasize on how common this is. If you haven't watched the past two videos, please head over there. Same thing with the definitions of this, so I'll just jump right straight into the meat of the discussion. So we'll start with chronic hypertension without superimposed eclampsia. So this is just a patient that had pre-existing chronic hypertension. So it's going to be beginning prior or before to 24 weeks and or rather 20 weeks and this is going to be defined as a sustained BP greater than 140 and or a diastolic blood pressure greater than 90 documented on more than one occasion prior to 20 weeks gestation and this patient may have had a history before them actually getting pregnant. It is also defined as hypertension that existed before the pregnancy or hypertension that persists beyond the 12 weeks after delivery, so well beyond the puparium. It usually is not associated with significant proteinuria or end organ damage if it is well controlled. The pathophysiology is going to be lying due to vasospasms caused by causing actually decreased end organ perfusion resulting in injury as well as damage. So the acute problems arise from excessive systolic pressure, whereas the long-term problems arise from excessive diastolic pressures. So how do we manage these patients? So generally antenatal care. So we stop any contraindicated antihypertensive drugs like diuretics, ACE inhibitors. We order for an ultrasound for major fetal anomalies. We involve the physicians for secondary causes. Baseline labs, so send blood for LFTs, creatinine, full blood count, 24-hour urine protein collection test. Consider endoscopy or eye examination as well as an ECG. Antenatal care is done every two weeks until 28 weeks. Then after you do it weekly, treatment of the hypertension should be commenced with the hydralazine, just like we've been managing all the other patients in the previous video, labetalo, as well as nifedipine and or methyldopa. If the blood pressure still persists beyond the postpartum period, then we can commence them on atenolol. So we deliver them at 38 weeks if they are stable and asymptomatic. Then we induce labor if there are no contraindications to vaginal delivery. Then active management of the third stage of labor should use oxytocin as opposed to egometrin. So I've talked of all these drugs and the dosages. That is why I'm not emphasizing on them. If you haven't watched the video, please, I emphasize again, watch the other two videos. So what's the prognosis? So good prognosis if the BP is between 140 over 90 and 
179 over 109 and there's no evidence of end organ damage. Poor prognosis if there's a severe hypertension with end organ damage. Cardiac, renal or retinal. So if there's renal disease, pregnancy loss rate actually increases significantly if the creatinine levels are greater than 1.4 milligrams per deciliter. Retinopathies where you have long-standing hypertension is usually associated with retinovascular changes, including hemorrhage, exudates, and narrowing. Then with the left ventricular hypertrophy, this is mostly seen with women with prolonged BPs greater than 180 over 1110. The wish prognosis carries a tenfold higher rate of fetal loss if the BP is uncontrolled before conception or early in pregnancy and chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia usually develops. Now, what about chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia? This actually complicates 25% of patients who actually have chronic hypertension. So it's actually preeclampsia, either mild or severe, in patients that previously had hypertension, those that have chronic hypertension in pregnancy. So here they will have hypertension before 20 weeks that initially had no evidence of proteinuria or evidence of end organ damage in the early pregnancy, but then developed evidence of proteinuria after 20 weeks of gestation. So often this is going to be occurring in the early uh, pregnancy and has actually severe fetal growth restriction implications than preeclampsia without chronic hypertension and is going to be associated with increased risk of placenta abruption. Risk factors include renal insufficiency, hypertension for the previous four years or more, and hypertension in a previous pregnancy. The diagnosis is made on the basis of establishing that this patient had chronic hypertension along with one of the following things. So a documented rise in the BP values, demonstrated worsening proteinuria, evidence of maternal jeopardy which could be manifested by headaches, epigastric pain, visual changes, thrombocytopenia, elevated liver enzymes, pulmonary edema, oliguria, or cyanosis, as well as edema which may or may not be present. But remember, edema is no longer used as a diagnostic criteria for preeclampsia. Then laboratory abnormalities in chronic uh, hypertension in patients in mild hypertension and no end organ damage, you may get normal lab tests. Those that have renal disease may show features of decrease in renal function tests. They may show proteinuria. They may have a lowered creatinine clearance value. They may have elevated blood urea nitrogenous wastes, creatinine, as well as uric acid levels. And I think my battery is about to die out. Sorry about that. My battery actually went flat. So in the management of the condition, prompt delivery is actually indicated. We do administer IV magnesium sulfate to prevent complications. Just like with the other topics that we looked at, we do give either using the pre-chard regimen in our setup or the Zuspan regimen. So the pre-chard is intramuscular. You give a loading dose of 14 grams, 4 grams IV over 3 to 5 minutes, then 10 grams deep IM, 5 grams in each buttock. The maintenance dose of 5 grams IM for hourly alternating buttocks. Of course, you can also give it intravenously 4 to 6 grams IV over 15 to 20 minutes and a maintenance dose of 1 to 2 grams per hour IV. Then, of course, we do repeat the dose of magnesium sulfate only if the knee jerk response is present, the urine output is greater than 30, the respiratory rate is greater than 12. We can give calcium gluconate 1 gram over 10 minutes if there is a decrease in the respiratory rate. Recall that the therapeutic level of serum magnesium is about 4 to 7 milliequivalents. And once this has exceeded this threshold, we can actually stop the magnesium sulfate if there is evidence of toxicity. But generally, we want to stop it 24 hours after the last seizure or delivery, whichever comes first. If a patient has these recurrent fits, we give them a further 2 milligrams IV bolus over five minutes in the above regimens that I've just talked about. Then we also want to keep the BP, the diastolic blood pressure between 90 to 100 using our hydralazine and or labetalol. Hydralazine is our drug, is the drug that we're going to be using, but the drug of choice is actually labetalol in dropping the BP if the diastolic pressure is greater than 1, 110. So we give five to 10 milligrams IV every 15 to 60 minutes, a maximum dose of 30 milligrams, IV and the maintenance dose of 10 mg per hour. Then labetalol is 10 to 20 mg IV every 10 minutes until the BP is less than 160 over 1110, a maximum dose of 300 mg IV and a maintenance dose of 40 mg per hour. 
then if the BP remains still high, above 160 over 110, despite you giving hydralazine, you can give 10 milligrams of nifedipine sublingual. Then with methyl dopa, after the BP is controlled and you want to maintain the diastolic between 90 and 100, we can give methyl dopa 250 to 500 milligrams three times a day or four times a day, and or nifedipine 10 to 20 milligrams twice a day orally. And of course, we can also give a tenolol if their postnatal blood pressure is still greater than 160 over 110. We should attempt vaginal delivery with IV oxytocin infusion if the mother and the fetus are stable. Then the prognosis, usually adverse pregnancy outcomes for both the mother and the baby are markedly increased. There is a higher risk of placenta abruption. Now coming back to our warm-up question, you are doing postpartum rounds on a 22-year-old G1 para 1 mother who vaginally delivered an infant male at 36 weeks after an induction for severe preeclampsia. During her labor, she required hydralazine to control her blood pressures. She is on magnesium sulfate for seizure prophylaxis. Her vital signs are blood pressure 154 over 98, pulse 93, respiratory rate of 24, and a temperature of 37.3. She has adequate urine output at greater than 40 cc per hour. On examination, she is oriented to time, place, and person, but she is somnolent and her speech is slurred. She has good movement and strength of her extremities, but her deep tendon reflexes are absent. Which of the following is the most likely symptom? So this woman is actually displaying features of magnesium toxicity. The other options just seem rather ridiculous. Thank you for spending your time to listen to this video and i really hope that you now understand about hypertensive disorders of pregnancy if you do consider subscribing to the channel hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time i post my name is dr moses kazevu until next time bye bye